This is uh, Michael Harris Bond. I am making this presentation for the International Wisdom Summit 2021. I'm intending to talk to the topic of perceiving another as wise and its interpersonal consequences across cultures. I want to um, preface my talk by expressing my appreciation for Igor Grossman's diligent uh, communications with me over the last two months to make my contribution to the Wisdom Summit um, valuable in light of his intended goals for the project. Okay, to begin then, I want to indicate that I'm approaching the topic of wisdom, which I signal in the color purple, as a cross-cultural social personality psychologist. This is my academic profile from the past half century. And I will tackle this challenging presentation uh, in light of that background. As a personologist in psychology, I ask, what are the characteristics of wise persons? However, they're identified as being wise. And so I, in consequence, study what um, I consider to be the motivations and the cognitions, perhaps the cognitive style, intelligence, the worldview, including issues like primals, social axioms, and so forth, that I identify as being part of what it is to be considered wise, however I identify um, my targets as being wise. So we're looking at the features of individuals considered by any metric, whatever metric, to be wise. As a social psychologist, I ask a somewhat different question. I ask, what are the interpersonal dynamics associated with another considered as wise and the outcomes that follow? for a person identified by others as wise. So I take this painting from Socrates drinking the hemlock as a way of putting into lived motion the consequences for a person considered by others in the painting to be wise. Now, this is not the usual consequence, of course, but it is historically one of those consequences of what may happen to somebody who um, embodies wisdom in his social environment. And it's that social environment that I want to consider as a cross-culturalist. I ask what difference does it make um, for an actor to be considered wise in his culture or her culture of socialization. Okay, so the premises I want to put in play for grounding a cross-cultural study on the interpersonal dynamics of perceiving a relational partner as wise, I'm going to now specify as 
background and setting in motion um, this imagined approach that I would take to studying um, the interpersonal dynamics associated with a person considered as wise across different cultural groups of socialization. So the basic premise is taken from Gibson's uh, early work on perception. And that is to say, perception is for doing. And I use the color red to indicate some kind of action or outcome associated with the internal process of perception. As a social psychologist, I move this forward to I elaborate this basic premise by saying that perceiving another is for doing or indeed not doing with that other. In other words, the other is providing us with affordances for action as indicated in the um, significant and seminal article by MacArthur and Barron in 1983 about social perception. Now, the dimensions that we use in perceiving others may be transculturally assessed as warmth and competence. I use color codings um, accordingly for those two different um, dimensions of perceiving others that have been identified in cross-cultural work. These uh, two dimensions are further subdivided into um, sociability and morality, the warmth, ability and assertiveness components um, for um, competence, respectively, in the work of Gandalf. Okay, well, further premises. Each components of these perceptions about the other signals and affordance for the actor provided by the other in meeting the actor's personal needs or desires, motivations uh, for action. Whoever treats me and others fairly and benignly in our exchanges will accrue a reputation as moral. And I'm using two colors here to indicate um, our perception of moral, as I will try to uh, suggest in the subsequent premises I'll develop. That is to say, both from the dimensions of um, warmth in green and blue in competence. What constitutes moral behavior in interpersonal exchanges then will vary according to the norms for right performance attached to the roles being played by interactants in their culture, the culture to which they have been socialized as competent actors. Further premises, across cultures, roles that people play vary across four dimensions of enactment or ways to consider and conceptualize the various roles that we play in life, uh, the complexity of the role pairing, uh, the child, the equality uh, of the role pairing, the adversarialness that characterizes the role pairing, and the containment that characterizes the role pairing, whether it's occurring in private uh, between individuals or it's uh, enacted in a public setting. The roles vary in this respect when they are being enacted. Cultural groups may be considered as generally emphasizing role playing for these four um, features of role enactment that are characteristic of the culture from which they come. And these uh, uh, four uh, basic uh, um, uh, scripts for role enactment uh, of a culture, characterizing a culture I take from the work of Alan Fisk. And these are communal sharing, equality matching, market pricing, and authority ranking. So this is one topology for distinguishing cultural groups in terms of their 
typical profile by which uh, roles in that cultural setting are enacted. Members of that type of culture then will be socialized to enact their roles according to their central cultural dynamic indicated in the work of Fisk. Doing the right thing in the right way. An actor plays his or her roles according to the general cultural script for role playing that characterizes that cultural dynamic. What will happen uh, in the actors doing so, any actors doing so, is that they will then be accorded a reputation by others across the four pan-cultural components of person perception. The way we see others will be shaped by the way they have shown us in their role and actments across time to this point in our acquaintance with them, either direct acquaintance through our personal engagement or indirect um, acquaintance through the kind of reputation that they have developed and has been communicated to us through our social networks. Perceived effectiveness in the role and actments will be associated with the actor's perceived character profile across the four components of person perception I mentioned before. Let me elaborate. In terms of how culture may make a difference uh, in how this uh, um, reputation is developed. Each cultural system develops a, um, um, a socialization set of practices out of their ecological and historical circumstances. And in that cultural system that has been developed across time, they will prioritize certain qualities of character in their members and socialize them accordingly. I'm using the work of Bond and Lund uh, in 2014, looking at cultural differences and priorities attached to different qualities of character development to distinguish um, cultural groups around the globe. The profile of the effective person will vary across cultures, therefore, with weights for the four components of person perception varying in terms of the socialization priorities in those national, territorial, or other forms of group culture. And I take this um, PowerPoint slide uh, of the work from Lund and Bond to indicate the positioning of existing national and territorial groups across the two dimensions that uh, have been extracted through the uh, World Values Survey um, uh, profiling of different national territorial groups relative to their emphasis on either other directedness in socializing children's qualities or self-directedness in socializing children's qualities across the, along the abscissa of this uh, uh, graph. And also along uh, up the ordinate, the emphasis on practicality in the lower part of the display, uh, as opposed to civility in the upper part of the display. So you see countries differing in their solution, I guess I would say, to their ecological and historical circumstances uh, that has resulted in contemporary emphases on how you socialize uh, your human capital for the future to be uh, functional uh, within your national territorial um, context. Okay, so that's a way of bringing culture into the equation of figuring out which of the four components of person perception are going to be involved and engaged 
in uh, judging a person as effective. So how do we then go about predicting the profile for effective actors in a given cultural system? In cultural systems prioritizing self-directedness, perceived competence, that is to say assertiveness, and I would say especially ability in another's role playing will be seen as relatively more effective than his or her perceived warmth. In judging that person's effectiveness as a role player in their cultural system. By contrast, in cultural systems prioritizing civility, perceived warmth, and that would be um, sociability component, but especially morality as a component in playing any of their roles will be seen as relatively more effective than his or her perceived competence. So the outcome in both, in any uh, cultural system then, is for um, the person's judged competence as a player of the typical role profiles that are um, assigned in that cultural system. But the relative weights of the components that go into the judgment of somebody as effective uh, are then varying across the uh, characteristics of the cultural system involved. What then is the equation for being perceived as wise? Well, I would hypothesize and claim that across cultural systems, persons perceived as effective are perceived as wise. So I use the purple color to indicate the equivalence in terms of these judgments. The reputation for being wise that an actor achieves in a cultural system is predicated, predicted by that culture's equation for effective role playing. And that formula I give below as um, a combination of their judged assertiveness, their judged ability, their judged sociability, and their judged morality. Sorry, that should be a plus sign there. As shaped by different beta weights dependent upon the cultural system in which they are functioning. So that's a kind of equation for the judgment of somebody as wise, which is overlapping with the judgment of someone as effective. Is this presentation then of my hypotheses around the issue of culture and wisdom appropriate for this wisdom summit? Well, that's the question, and I remind listeners of the three questions that Igor Grossman has presented to us presenters to address. And I think that one of the questions relevant to my presentation is the, is the issue of whether there appears to be some consensus among scientists, with over 30% of conference participants suggesting that experiential knowledge and sympathy, compassion are central to wisdom and accessible to a similar extent across cultures. What is your take on these claims is the question that we presenters were, uh, one of the three questions we were presented to address by Igor. So the focus here is experiential knowledge, sympathy and compassion. Uh, and their uh, relationship to wisdom. Well, my take on this question, my answer, uh, 
I guess, is that experiential knowledge is important if we regard that knowledge as arising from role performance perceived as effective. So yes, experience and knowledge are important uh, as accumulated by an individual if it results from effective action and the perception of that person as an effective, an actor or role player in that cultural system. And yes, sympathy, compassion are central to wisdom, uh, being judged as wise and accessible to a similar extent across cultures. That is a rather general way to state the importance of um, sympathy and compassion. But I have indicated my caveat here, relatively less impactful in cultures prioritizing self-directedness and practicality. Practicality is the opposite of civility, by the way, uh, in the two-dimensional structure I presented, after we have controlled for wealth. So I'm trying to put here in place the cultural nuancing, you might say, that will be uh, accorded uh, to the judgments that persons make about who is wise in different cultural settings on the basis of the socialization practices in uh, a given culture. Those socialization practices, of course, arise because of the functional requirements that have uh, accumulated uh, uh, across time uh, in that, uh, for that uh, cultural group. Yes, it's complicated, but it's complicated because it's nuanced and it's nuanced because we need to bring into the equation, the judgment equation uh, that's used uh, by social perceivers uh, that responds to the demands of their cultural system. So to close, um, let me um, redefine or perhaps refine Mark Twain's wisdom about rightness and right behavior. As you may recall, he used the expression, always do right, this will gratify some people and astonish the rest. Well, I would maintain that doing right depends on the actors role playing effectively in that cultural system. So that actors who do right in the right way in their cultural system will be regarded as wise. Okay, that's a hypothesis, a set of hypotheses based upon the premises I have developed and embraced over the course of my um, 50 years post PhD, working as a cross-cultural social psychologist. And um, as I best conceive it now, that's um, the way in which I can uh, make some contribution to um, this um, Wisdom Summit so um, uh, innovatively and presciently uh, conceptualized by Igor Grossman and his team working in Guelph, uh, working in um, London. So pleased, thank you. Um, I hope this stimulates some conversation and uh, development of your thoughts um, if you wish to consider the role of culture in this process of uh, understanding wisdom.